Right this way, guys. Welcome, welcome. Uh, yeah. Yes, indeed. Um, so uh, I guess we'll start on this wall. Um, yeah. Well, you know, actually, there's one thing before that. It, it all kind of starts with that guy. Um, you know, he uh, changed 20th century magic, and he's got a little place of honor right there on the wall, and we'll end with something that he would have uh, gotten a kick out of had he ever had a chance to see one. Okay. Um, and uh, we'll start here. So I collect a lot of things, but in this room are two primary things, um, gambling and cheating stuff, some apparatus, uh, a lot of antiquarian books, and then of course magic stuff, which most of you know uh, the magicians are going to be familiar with the books on the wall. I'll point out a couple of favorites as we go along. But the stuff in this case is uh, special to me because uh, it's genuinely difficult to find. Um, uh, I know you guys know about Erdnase. That's uh, the one that most of the magicians uh, sort of gravitate towards when they come in here because they know that book. Well, let's, let's get a good shot of this. This is the first edition of Erdnase on display. Yep. It is not the only one you own. Nope. I own three of them, uh, but that's the best looking cover. And so I put it cover outwards. Um, and uh, so it's the one that the magicians know and they gravitate toward, towards. How but many exist? Probably right around 100 or so. Okay. Uh, Richard Hatch started tracking them 15 or 20 years ago, and he had up to 80 copies. And since then, about 20 more copies have surfaced, and I try to keep track of them loosely. I don't, you know, I don't know where every one of them is, but I try to keep track of who's got one, especially when I hear or see you know, that one sold somewhere. I'll ask someone that was in the audience, hey, who got that? You know, who bid on that? Who raised their hand at that auction or whatever? Uh, but there's some other fun stuff up here. Um, uh, starting over here, we've got a grand expose on the science of gambling, 1860, also published anonymously. Nobody knows who that was. Huh. Uh, and unlike Erdnase, we have no clue who that was. You know, at least with Erdnase, you kind of, you know, were leaning towards an E.S. Andrews, perhaps, or a James Andrews, or a Charles Andrews, maybe, I think are the best theories. We have zero idea who an adept is, and that was uh, what he called himself, which I think is a great pseudonym. Yeah. Uh, next to that, How Gamblers Win, another uh, published uh, pseudo-anonymously book. We actually do know who wrote that book. Um, that is a second edition. The first edition is just sort of a, a black cover with gold text. It's not very visually interesting to look at. But that's, uh, that's a second edition. It's a beautiful cover, so I put it on display. Um, one of my greatest uh, achievements ever was paying $54.00 for one of only two copies of Koshit's Manual of Useful Information in private hands. And a month later, one sold at auction for $8,000. Wow. So, so how did you, how does it happen? I, I popped on eBay one day and there it, and was. There it was, buy it now for 54 bucks. Oh. So I bought it and then you're kind of in a weird position because I don't want to like email the person I bought it from and say, hey, do me a favor, would you insure that for about six grand right. for me? That'd be great. Um, so I let her, it was a, the bookseller seemed to be female uh, just based on the eBay name. I let her mail it to me without really doing anything other than just paying for it. And she sent it media mail. So it took a month to get here. And I was convinced it was lost and finally it, it showed up and it's perfect. Only the second copy known to exist in private hands. And how is it? It's, you know, a, a reprint has been available from the Gambler's Book Club for years. It's got a lot of great stuff in it. First known publication of the Greek deal is in that book. Uh, there's a couple of cool things in there. It predates Erdnase by uh, a couple of years. So there's a few things you wonder why he didn't also include. Uh, I think the countdown, which was an old gambling cheating technique is in that book, I believe. Um, and uh, that was something they were actually using back in those days. And it's one of the sort of missing pieces from, uh, from Erdnay. It's like, why didn't he include the countdown? Um, this book, The Secret of Reading Cards While Dealing, that's the only known copy of that. Um, and I don't know why, because it only dates back to the 1920s. But when I bought it uh, at auction, um, I called like the usual suspects. I called Byron Walker. I called Andy Gregan. I called Steve Forty. 
uh, and I called a, a bunch of other people, Terry Roses, and I said, hey, secret of reading cards while dealing, what do you know about it? Not only did no one have a copy, they'd never heard of it. Um, and so I bought it, and it's a little bitty monograph on the heel peak. Um, the ability to you know pitch cards around a table and peek at each one before you deal it out. Um, and it's really a cool, scarce little book. I'm sure there's another one out there somewhere. I can't imagine they only printed one. Who's the author? Uh, I don't remember the author's name uh, because it's hard to tell if it's actually an author or if it's just Publisher. the publisher's right. name. Sure. Um, but yeah, it's a little bitty monograph on uh, on the heel peak. And uh, you know, a couple other things in here that aren't really one of a kind like that, but. I don't know, but one other person in the whole world that's got both of those little manuscripts. They're just kind of cool and rare and they never show up at auction. Uh, so when they did, I grabbed them. So that's, uh, that's the sort of um, antiquarian gambling book stuff uh, on display. What can you tell us about this? So that is a, a gaffed carnival game that is ingenious. Um, the way it would work is Typically, the operators would have placed prizes out here um, in between these little pegs. So, you know, uh, a, a spin might have cost you a nickel. Okay, imagine it's 1925, uh, might have cost a nickel. Uh, and out here might have been glued down a quarter. So if, if the spinner landed here, you won five to one on your money. And over here might have been a dime, and over here might have been a piece of gum, which was only worth a penny. That would have been, you know, you still got a prize, but you paid for that one. Uh, candy, piece of gum, nickel, win your money back, dime, quarter, all the way around the perimeter. But it can be gaffed because the way this arrow works, at a, at a certain height, that little um, plastic tab, you see how it passes in between mm -hmm. that screw hole and doesn't actually contact it, but this one it falls off of? So it can be raised up to hit every one of them or to skip every other one, depending on what the That's operator smart. does. They push a little secret button and that arrow spindle will actually raise up a little bit, you know, half a centimeter or so. And so all the good prizes are on one track uh, and all the bad prizes or the, you know, the piece of gum, piece of candy prizes are all on the other track. And the interesting thing about it is, is that the psychology works backwards they would push the gaff to show it fair, okay? And then spin it and show that it sometimes lands on a quarter. Right. You, you win five to one. And then when it was your turn to spin, they would step away from it. Well, and you. now they're you know five feet away and you can't get it to work because it was gaffed when it was on. Right. Um, and now that it, you know, they're off of the gaff, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna bring up a loser every time. What is it that appeals to you about ripping off little kids? Is it um, just, <laughs> you just know part what's, of your nature? Or? So you youngsters have probably never been to a carnival or a fair where they were really going for the money. But when I was 10 years old, that stuff still happened in the South. I know you grew up in Ohio. I grew yeah. up in Tennessee. Um, and um, every year the uh, fair would come through. And I remember a razzle, which is that game up there which is an absolutely devastating game. I remember a razzle booth at the fair when I was like nine, 10 years old. I didn't understand what was going on at the time, of course, but uh, I really saw that stuff. And so that's what sort of got me interested I'm in that. I'm familiar with the razzle, what is that? Uh, the razzle is the greatest carnival con game of all time. Uh, without question, it's the biggest money maker. Um, and the way the razzle works is you have a cup full of, uh, say, eight marbles. And you shake up the marbles and you throw them out uh, onto that little board with all the numbers. And the uh, operator of the game would pick up the marbles very quickly and total them, okay? So six plus five is 11 plus three is, you know, uh, and all the way up. Then they would take that total and look at a piece of paper that had all the totals on it. Uh, in fact, I can show you what the uh, piece of papers look like. Is that another one? Yeah, it's another razzle set. Really, two razzle sets. Well, tell us what you were saying before. Two is one. And... Exactly. Um, Michael Weber told me a long time ago, one is none and two is one. 
So um, I buy duplicates of everything if I can. So uh, you get a total after we add up your marbles. Um, and then they say your total is uh, 15. Okay, that gets five coupons. If you get to 50 coupons, you win your choice of these wonderful prizes. And these weren't teddy bears. These were um, stereo systems, televisions, you know, big prizes. And it would cost you a dollar for a roll. So you're thinking, wait a minute, I've only got to get to 50? And in my first roll, I'm already at 15? How, I mean, this will only take me like five minutes and I'm going to get 50 coupons and uh, I'm going to win a TV. Okay, I'm in. The problem is, kind of like with this device over here, they're cheating you um, to give you points to set the hook in your mouth. Once they've given you uh, five coupons here, 10 coupons there, 20 coupons there. Now you're at 35 coupons. You only need 50 more to go. Now the game all of a sudden becomes fair and you have no shot at ever getting a total that actually gives you points. So they cheat for you just long enough to set that hook in your brain and then they back off and the whole thing works legitimately. And legitimately, you just can't ever get there. And then there's all sorts of other crazy things here, like if they add you up to 29, oh, you landed on add a prize. Now what that means, Josh, is you're not just playing for the TV, but you're also playing for the brand new Xbox. If you get to 50 coupons, you're gonna, coupons, you're gonna win both prizes. Of course, two prizes means it's now two bucks a roll, but you're okay with that, right? And before you know it, yeah. we've emptied your wallet and about the time you start to get suspicious, we have long switched over to counting the game fairly, you know, so we can pick those marbles up nice and slow. You can count them yourself and you're always going to land on these numbers that just don't get you anywhere. So that's the razzle. Uh, the razzle still exists to this day, believe it or not. You see it in gas stations in the south where they'll go, you know, they'll talk to some tourists, they'll rope them into the back room. Um, it showed up in New York City about a decade ago. Guys playing with uh, ping pong balls in a big floating vat of water. And you had like this fish hook device that you had to pull ping pong balls out of the water. The ping pong balls all had numbers on them. But the same principle, they would count the numbers up in such a way that you thought you were making progress towards uh, winning a prize. And the truth is you never were. I love it. So, uh, so mechanically, it's just fake counting. It's just fake counting. It's, uh, you know who used to do the razzle? Jeff McBride. Really? Jeff and I have had conversations about the razzle before. He can actually still do the spiel. Like if you say, hey, Jeff, do you still remember your razzle spiel? He'll go, yeah. And he'll, it'll take him a second to get into that character, but he can sort of rattle off the, oh. a razzle spiel. Very cool. Yeah, wow. Let me find a razzle. Uh, eBay is where I got the one up there. Uh, this one was a gift from uh, C40. And I, I also have all these Razzle layouts um, and they're all a little different, but conceptually they're identical. Sometimes you'll see one structured as an American football field. You gotta get a hundred yards to win the prize. The coolest one I ever saw, which I don't own, I actually lost on eBay, uh, was a Star Trek. Uh, razzle layout, but that tells you that's modern. You know, yeah. Star Trek was 67 or so, something like that. That's a modern piece. Um, that could date back to the 20s for all we know, who knows? Uh, but Star Trek clearly means they were doing that in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, razzle is also described in all the classic carnival game texts. Uh, Scarney's got a big section on it in his uh, Scarney on gambling. Um, Ortiz has got a section on it in gambling scams, a fantastic section on it in gambling scams actually. Um, so, so the, this cabinet over here, um, unfortunately is packed to the gills with stuff. I wish it was a little bit nicer. So you have to get the camera in here pretty close to uh, see all the goodies in here. Um, top shelf is basically legitimate playing cards. Um, I have the, here we can open this up. So maybe reduce some glare for you. Um, I have the very first bicycle ace of spades ever uh, produced. Uh, I've actually got two of them because one is none and uh, 
well, you guys get the idea. So Bicycle, as you know, has changed their Ace of Spades design a couple of times over the years, but this was the very first one. And this was actually on a bicycle back. That's on a Lotus back, I think. And this was the very first Joker, which they called the best bower. So beautiful. What was the back design? Uh, this was a rider back. It's pretty um, much the same back design as we know today. Yeah, basically. Um, so they made this, this style Ace of Spades and this style Joker for about a decade, I think, before they changed over to a new style. Um, I could be, you know, off a little bit on that timeline, but that's close enough. Um, and yeah, that's, I think, what they call the Lotus back, which you can get reprints of today. Uh, Josh, I know that you are interested in Civil War yes. stuff. So that's um, no, that a real, real? Uh, Civil War deck. It was sort of a uh, a novelty deck even back then. But that's a period piece, um, and it's got the, uh, I don't know who anybody is, if these are actually real people, but that's a real deck of cards from, you know, 1866, 1867, something like that. And there's actually a funny story about this. Um, this almost still white. Oh, yeah, it's crazy, yeah. So this was given to me. This was a gift because the person that gave it to me thought it was a facsimile. Yeah. He said, here, you can have these. These are modern reprints. They're so white. And I went, oh, cool, modern reprints. Now, we knew the box was period, but we thought these were modern reprints, which they still They've sell. I've got, a, time, yeah, so. I've got a deck of the modern reprints back there. So I showed them to Tom Dawson, who has since passed away. Uh, Tom was the uh, president of the uh, 52 Plus Joker Playing Card Association. And Tom took one look at these and said, uh, this is not a modern reprint, these are real. And I went, really? He said, yeah, this is just a fantastic deck, but these are the real thing. And so I went back to the guy that gave them to me and I said, hey, you know, you can have these back because you probably didn't realize they were real. And he said, ah, keep them. So. That's nice. You have good friends. I do. That's gorgeous. But yeah, pretty, uh, pretty cool. I want to talk about the tarot book. Is it gimmick? It is. Um, that is a Gaft uh, Will and Fink Pharaoh box. Will and Fink is sort of the Cadillac of the uh, uh, the gambling apparatus makers, uh, based in San Francisco at the turn of the century, um, and they I think lasted into uh, into the twentieth century a little bit. I don't know if they made it all the way to like the nineteen twenties. Uh, there's probably people out there that uh, know more about the company than I do. But they're a famous knife maker. Uh, but they also made some um, uh, some gambling stuff. So that's a Will and Fink card trimmer over there, and this is a Will and Fink Pharaoh box that I. It's another eBay score for me because the person that had it didn't know it was gaffed, and if a box is gaffed, it's worth about five times as much as if it's not gaffed. Um, but I know that Pharaoh boxes aren't supposed to have little buttons on the bottom. And so the seller made the mistake of showing that button in the auction. Now, right now, it doesn't move because uh, most Faro boxes have a lockup mechanism. And the lockup mechanism is the base plate down here. If you pull these little tabs towards the opening, they move. And it's not just because they're loose, it's because they're supposed to move. And now you can actually press that little button. And by pressing that little button, there's a clockwork mechanism in here uh, that this gap, this is not a rare deck of cards or anything, but that gap that's supposed to only allow one card to come out will open slightly for two cards to come out at once. So sort of a precursor to a double lift in a sense, except all you're doing is putting it straight onto the table. So not a so big deal. So what would it do allow you to deal seconds? Um, it doesn't allow you to deal seconds per se, but it allows you to deal a double card. Okay. And so uh, it actually gets kind of complex because um, remember there's a case keeper up there keeping track of all the cards that are played. So typically the way this would work is your case keeper kind of had to be in on it. Because the case keeper, the guy moving those little uh, pegs up there on, you know, kind of looks like an abacus, um, the dealer wasn't the one doing that. So if the dealer did the dirty work and moved a card over, 
um, the case keeper would have to know how to adjust. Otherwise, you're going to wind up, you've gone all the way through the deck, but you still got one card that hasn't shown up. Mm -hmm. And they had various ways of getting around that that we don't have to go into since it's an obsolete game. game Pharaoh, right? This is for the game of Pharaoh. Yeah. So that's a gaffed Pharaoh box. It's, it's a uh, double dealing box that allows you to deal two cards. Um, and, you know, I mean, I paid a couple hundred dollars for it, but it's worth thousands, maybe $2,000 because it's a gaffed Will and Fink. And again, the seller just didn't realize what they had. And did Will and Fink make normal Pharaoh boxes too, or only during? Uh, yes, they did. Um, so the game was pretty much a cheating game from, you know, from the very, very early days. But I guess you had to have uh, a, a normal box around just in case you know somebody demanded to e examine it or whatever so yeah there are a few makers not just will and fink but a couple of other makers over the years and most of them made ungaffed boxes um, but the gaffed ones are far and away uh, the most desirable can i ask you a question i have one sure. of these but i don't exactly know what it does i know it's for a cuff, these little things you see. This these thing in, right here? Yeah, you see these. Yeah, so that's not a cheating device, although it's often sold that way on eBay. It is a cuff holder. So um, at the turn of the century, men's suits had removable celluloid cuffs. So you had plastic cuffs that you could put on and a plastic neck, neck piece or whatever that you put on, collar, exactly. Um, and what you could do is after, you know, you got hot and sweaty doing whatever in the days before air conditioning, you could go up to your room, take the collar off, which probably had the sweat band on it and all that, put a fresh collar on, put fresh cuffs on. So all that was, was a cuff holder. And somewhere along the way, someone got it into their head that it's a holdout, that it's a cheating device, that you could slip a card into it. Um, I don't believe that for a second for two reasons. First of all, I've tried it. It's impossible to move a card in and out of that thing. Uh, there's so many easier ways to hold out a card that I just don't believe it for a second. But the most damning evidence that it was never a cheating device is that none of the catalogs ever mention it. And they would have sold you a rock if they thought you could use it as a cheating device. So the fact that none of the catalog people for a hundred years ever sold that tells me that the idea it's a cheating device is a modern invention. Um, there's one book in, out of all these cheating books that I have, and these are just the pretty ones on display, but the Monte Carlo Secret Service book is the only book I've ever run across that says that was a cheating device. And I don't know if they invented the myth or if they were just repeating the myth that had already come about, but it's the only book that says it was, and I says it wasn't. When we talk about this, this must be a shiner. What's that, the pipe? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the pipe has a little mirror inside there. Um, and it's just uh, one example of many of ways that you can get a reflection off of a normal everyday object. Now, pipes, of course, don't normally have mirrors inside them, but this was a gift to me at my sister's wedding. And I took one look at it and went, well, that's a shiner waiting to happen. So I, I threw it in here. Um, I bought this in a casino here in town. And that's shiny enough, you know, you could uh, shave in that thing practically. You can certainly see re reflections of cards that, in it. Is this for readers? Uh, yeah, the contact lens is for um, what's called luminous work. Luminous to a lot of people seems very modern. It's actually not, it dates back to the twenties. So we're talking a hundred year old technology at least, and maybe even older than that. So a lot of people have seen luminous before. This card, believe it or not, has a big X on the back of it, and this is just a, a sample card. And you typically can't see it unless you put a red lens over the top of it, and then that X jumps out nicely, and it should show up in the camera. Um, I've got a few types of marked cards that are very difficult to see in camera, but we see this here in the room instantly. Just the minute you yeah. put that on, it's like that big X uh, jumps out at you. Um, but as soon as you come back to here, you don't really see anything. Now, the truth is I can see it, but the only reason I can see it is because I've spent so much time with this type of marking. Um, it's actually visible, but it's hard to see because of the slightly green tinted ink on a very busy red background. 
Uh, but there are scientific reasons why anything that shows up under a filter like that, um, a simple subtractive filter like this, um, all it's doing is making it easier to see. It, it cannot bring something that's truly invisible into the visible spectrum. It can't do that. Contact lenses would do the same thing. There's a great story about uh, a guy um, wearing these contact lenses here in town who apparently had never worn them out in the real world before, but they had a big play down at Caesar's Palace. He had both contacts in. He stepped out of his limousine and couldn't see anything in the bright Vegas sun and fell right into the main fountain at oh, Caesar's wow. Palace, and they had to scrub the play. So he didn't That's actually amazing. make it uh, inside. What about these powders and liquids? So the powders are a daub um, set where you can actually mix and match your own uh, daubs. Those are probably so old that they wouldn't work particularly well anymore. But these are a little mini collection of daubs. Um, so every one of those little containers is a different daub. Uh, they tend to come in um, silver, black, uh, a greenish tint, and then sort of a brownish tint that looks like a tobacco stain. Um, and so there's a little blue spot right on the center of that card. I don't know if you can see it yeah, or not. Right in the middle, right, right there. Right in the middle. It uh, may not read on camera, but it's definitely there. And if you move it around, it actually gets easier to see for most people. Um, and this is basically the same idea. It's harder to see, probably because I just put it on a little lighter. Uh, and this is silver. It's still hit right in the center, but it's a it's silver it's daub. A it it's a, yeah, it looks a little faded. Exactly right. So here's something about this first one with the blue spot that I pointed out to you. Uh, and I love doing this to people. Um, you see the little blue spot right in the center. This is the first card I showed you, right? Uh, but you might have missed that there's also red daub on this card here and here. There's a red spot there and a red spot there. And it's hard to see, but it's definitely there. And it just goes to show you that um, if, you, if you don't know exactly what you're looking for, we can even be discussing daub and you'll still miss it, you know? So now imagine you're trying to pick this off in a game and you're not even thinking yeah. about Dob. So yeah, there- I can't believe people would read that in a way that, that wouldn't be suspected because it's so light. It is very light. So that's blue. This must be red. So a lot of people don't know that you can put red Dob on a blue card and vice versa. And would the Chiefs be doing that in real time or switching in a day? No, typically in real time. So this stuff is dried out a little bit. It's hard to hard to see, but it is going on there. And, uh, you know, we've got all the lights on in here. And sometimes that makes it easier to see. Sometimes it makes it harder to see. But there's a little pink tint now that I can see uh, right here at those two corners. The funny thing about Dob is, you know, we go our whole lives ignoring that little blemish on your sunglasses, ignoring that little tiny spot on the windshield of your car. And uh, your brain filters that stuff out because it's not important. And when you're reading this type of work, you have to pay attention to those little inconsistencies and imperfections in color. Yeah. And what's really funny is a lot of people, if you, spend, if you spend a month playing with a juice deck or playing with Daub or something like that, you'll start to see things in your couch. You'll look at your couch and you'll be like, what is that? Or you'll look at the carpet and you'll go, somebody spilled wine here mm. 10 years, years ago. ago. Yeah, exactly. You can just see those little imperfections that our brain normally tries to filter out for us. Um, why don't you show us a couple more gizmos and then I want to move over to the Okay, the absolutely. Collection. So I've got something really cool um, here. Actually, I mean, there's a lot of things that are really cool here, but one of the, one of the most interesting things is, uh, well, this little guy, which uh, we'll have to hold up for the camera, and then I'll get this out. Yeah, sure. You want to sit here so you can Yeah, that's it? fine. So the first thing I'll talk about is this little gizmo right here, which is just a wonderful example <laughs> of cheaters using their brain and then also um, 
putting together a little bit of technology because somebody had to have this made. So what this is, um, you know, a little tiny disc of metal, and it's got three sort of sharp teeth on it. And I'll have to kind of explain uh, the way this was designed to work. So this was designed to be glued to your thumb, okay? And there was a time in Las Vegas, um, throughout Nevada really, but especially here in Las Vegas, there was a time when they didn't cut the deck with one of these like they do now. So nowadays a blackjack dealer will shuffle the cards and then present the cut card to you and you do exactly what you just did. You insert the cut card, they uh, cut the deck at that point, and then they burn a card and now we deal blackjack. Okay, that's how it's done now. But even up until the 1980s, you could still cut by hand um, before the cut cards came along and they would complete the cut, okay? So this is a piece that literally would no longer work today because we're not allowed to cut by hand. But at that time, what this was designed to do is if it was glued to my thumb and I press it to the side of this deck, oh, it's measuring. It, it breaks the deck into packets of, I believe it's eight cards each, okay? And what they would do, we're, we're gonna fake this, but basically what it does is it produces this, okay? It produces a deck where you've got these little breaks in it like that, just by pressing your thumb against it. So what I would do is I would distract the dealer raise this up and flash it to a partner sitting way over here, okay? And then drop and cut here. The card I flashed is going to be the dealer's whole card. So by just going like that and cutting, I have broken off um, eight cards is typically the way it worked because that's one burn card, six players, the seventh card from the top now after the burn card, uh, is gonna be, wind up being the dealer's whole card. Um, and so that's what this little device was designed to do, was designed to section off exactly eight cards. Um, and really interesting, it's written about in Steve Forty's book, uh, Casino Game Protection, he has this a picture of this little device in there. Um, and uh, that's what it was designed to do. So to me, just a really ingenious little piece. I mean, someone went, hey, I sure wish there was a way right. to drop exactly the right number of cards after I flash. And, I'm just and there it is. I'm thinking there are magic applications for me. You, you bet. Instantly divide a deck in yep. packets of 10 or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So this guy's really interesting. A lot of people have heard of gaffed um, blackjack dealing shoes. Uh, in fact, I have about 10 gaffed shoes in my collection. Not all of them are on display because a lot of them are sort of duplicates that do the same thing. Um, and a great place to look at and read about gaffed blackjack shoes is in Darwin Ortiz's Annotated Erdnase. Um, so you can see uh, a prism shoe in that book. And in fact, I have that prism shoe from the book that I got from Darwin. It's down there in the collection. But this is interesting because um, very few people have ever seen one of these, and it's gonna be difficult for the camera to see this, but it is possible to read on camera because I've, I've done it before. Uh, this is, first of all, it's not a blackjack shoe, it's a Baccarat shoe. So blackjack shoes typically hold um, up to eight decks, but they usually will only put six or six decks in them. This will actually hold, um, I think, close to 10 decks, but they typically put eight decks in them. Um, and what this does, is it also reflects the top card of the deck. The difference is the dealer does not have to be in on it. So with a standard blackjack shoe, you have to lift the top card up into the peak position and then a little prism built into the top of the shoe will show it to the dealer and the dealer can use that information and typically deal seconds with it. Uh, but this shoe um, actually will tell you what the top card of the deck is with out any dealer involvement. Now the dealer can, can be in on it, of course, but doesn't have to be. And what's crazy about it is, is you read it from the back of the shoe. So you see this 
the floor of the shoe, this slanted piece. Right now, clean oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. So if you look in there, there's a little clear spot mm -hmm. on the frosting and you can see the top card of the deck. If I move it, it'll be easier for the camera to see because now you can see motion in there. Can, Let's take it from my yeah, you have to, here, if we, if we right tilt it up. Yeah. Can you um, can you see the queen moving in there? It's a, it's direct. It's hard to see. You can just see it in the middle right now of the screen. There's, you can see it's slightly shinier. Well, but, you saw it, Queen of Clubs. It's hard to read on camera yeah. because it's hard to read in person. You guys actually saw it right away, so you're right. That's the Queen of Clubs. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see if I can get in the right position here. So looks like a black card, two of something. Nope, oh, that's a jack. I mean, maybe I was reading the wrong card down. So four of clubs looks like, 10 of clubs. You know what? I think I'm reading the second card. There's five of hearts, unless I'm a card off. There we go. So um, four of spades. All right. So what this right. is designed to do is, of course, it shows you the top card of the deck. But the interesting thing about that is you might wonder, how does it know? Because if you put a deck of cards in a shoe, aren't they sitting like this? I mean, how the hell does it know what the top card is? You can, you can bevel that deck all you want. You still can't see in there. So how is a piece of plastic doing that? And the answer is that inside the front of this shoe, that top card is actually allowed to slip downwards a little bit. But the faceplate is large enough that you can't tell that that's happened. Yeah, and of course, perfect. and now you're getting it from here. So that's what's happening underneath there is that top card is allowed to naturally slide really without any dealer involvement. Um, it works best when there's a lot of cards in here, which is why I've got it set up this way. But typically all the dealer has to do is this and just the natural motion, that next card will typically drop right into the peak position every time. And you could put a prism splitter back here built into the handle, which I actually have, but it's way easier to read as a demo piece without the handle. And that handle would shine that image to either side. So you can be dealing, and I could be sitting over here knowing what the top card of the deck was gonna be. And in Baccarat, you place your bet just like in blackjack, before the cards are dealt. If it's a good card, a seven, eight, or a nine in Baccarat are the most valuable cards, I'll bet one way. If it's a bad card, a two or a three or something like that, I'll bet the other way. Um, and you could absolutely demolish a game uh, with one of these in no time flat. Uh, this was sold to me by Rod the Hop's partner, uh, the guy that he got arrested with um, years ago, uh, over a decade ago. Uh, it was actually used in a casino in South America. I don't know which one. And when they brought it back into the U.S., they actually had two of them. I have both of them. Um, they destroyed it. So they ripped the plastic apart. Um, and that's so that if it was examined, no one could figure out that it was a cheating device. But they, they broke it. But the guy still had all the pieces. And I said, I'd like to have them and try to have it put back together. So I bought the pieces from the guy. Uh, I sent them to uh, a person who's an expert in these devices, and he actually was able to glue it back together so it functions as a demo piece, and also added a couple of trim pieces that we had lost uh, over the years. So cool. really cool piece. So there are three of these known to exist. I have two of them, and there's one in a private collection in Texas, um, which we think might have been the prototype. We're not sure, uh -huh. but uh, yeah, they're really neat. And once again, the to me, the lesson here is the ingenuity. Someone went, you know what? I bet if we made a prism this long and built it into the floor of the shoe, it would work just fine. And obviously they were right. I mean, someone's a genius. I don't know who, I don't know who made this, um, but someone was using their noodle the day they invented this thing. Uh, and it's just a really cool piece. And it just kind of goes to show you the, you know, the depths that these guys will go to, to win, you know, the kind of money that they could win. You know, Baccarat is one of those games where um, the limits are so high. You can, you can bet $50,000 a hand, which is what Phil Ivey was doing a couple of years ago in the UK. $50,000 a hand, it doesn't take much to tilt the odds in your favor and win, you know, every nickel in the joint. Yeah. So 
How would somebody oh, like cool. rob the hop? How would he have come across this? Is it? Do they buy anything? Just traveling in those circles, you know, someone may have had it for their use, and then that situation dried up, and now it's just sitting on a shelf. And the guy goes, "Hey, you know, I've got a buddy of mine that owns a casino in South America. Ooh, I've got something I think in a box that he might like." You know, that that's not what happened in this case, I don't think. But it's just like that. You know, they just yeah. have these conversations. It's like if you've got a spot, like if you own the casino or you're planning on maybe you've got people in surveillance that are going to look the other way for you, word gets around and some cheater puts something in your hands and says, hey, try this. If it works, give me a cut of the money. You know, can you talk just for a second about like for those of us watching who want to collect, like I'm so interested in the story of you found things on eBay. Like, What Mm -hmm. are your tips? for collecting things and finding bargains and knowing what things are worth and um so as far as finding it that's just tenacity i'm on ebay all the time and for a while there was every night i i have my searches that ebay will email you you know like if you want to buy you know, a particular magic book, you know, let's say you want a, a, a third edition of Expert Card Technique, which has got all the extra, right. uh, you know, Vernon and Daily stuff in the back. Well, you can go onto eBay and you can type Daybird, Expert Card Daybird. Technique, third edition, and save that search. And if one pops up that meets that criteria, they'll email you and tell you it shows up. So I do that. I've got 50 saved searches uh, over the years. Um, and so that's part of it. But then the other part of it is, Knowing that, um, knowing that a seller may not sell the thing the way you've searched for it. So what if that's sold as old magic book from my grandpa's attic? If that's the title of the auction, and I can't tell you how many times I've seen titles like that, your search in that's built into eBay, it'll never see it. And so now it's up to you to kind of get creative and and just do things like I'll search, I'll type gambling antique, um, which isn't very specific. And you would think, well, aren't you looking through thousands of items? Yep, that's where the tenacity comes in. I then scroll through a thousand items that I'm not interested in at all to occasionally find that one gem that someone has mislabeled because they don't know what it is. They found it in the attic or they bought it at an estate sale and have no idea what it is. Uh, Old, uh, like um, I bought my first Razzle by searching for um, Carnival Marble Game. I didn't put the word Razzle in there because the old lady that finds that in her attic or, you know, the young person going through grandpa's uh, basement that runs across that, they don't know the word razzle. They're not going to sell it as a razzle necessarily. It's, they probably can piece together that it's a game of some type. So antique carnival game or antique marble game is what you search for. And occasionally those things show up uh, for stuff like that. Do they come up regularly? Are we looking at like once a year yeah, a carnival well, game like this? Or? Well, I have five of those in my garage if you would like to uh, put one on your pocket on the way out the door. I have very big pockets. Yeah. Um, so yeah, these things don't come up very often. Uh, a, a buddy of mine and I bought five of them all at the same time. Uh, this is actually not one of them. I bought this one and then we bought those other five. Uh, Can you tell us what that does? So yeah, it's a it's a really cool thing. There's actually, do you know, are you familiar with Make Magazine? Yeah, of course. So Make Magazine did a whole article on this, which I've got the magazine over yeah. there. Uh, it's called a scissor bucket or a sucker bucket. Um, and I, I won't get it out and demo it because it takes up a little bit of time, but I'll tell you what it does. So the idea is, is you open up this catch basket. Um, and you've got a couple of baseballs. These are normal baseballs. There's uh, nothing wrong with the baseballs. You can also use lacrosse balls, but baseballs are uh, probably a little more historically accurate. There's a little flower image on the inside of this uh, basket. And the idea is that you stand right up to the foul line. You can't go over the foul line, but you stand right up next to the foul line. You toss the baseball in. It needs to hit the flower area if you miss the flower by a little bit it's still okay but it needs to hit the back and then fall straight through that hole in the bottom of the bucket and drop down into the bottom if you can do that two times in a row you win the teddy bear 
you can't do it two times in a row. You can do it once, but you won't do it two times in a row. And you can do it 50 times, but there won't be two in a row unless I let you do it two times in a row. Um, and the reason is, is they call it a scissor bucket or sucker bucket. Well, we know why they call it sucker bucket, but why do they call it scissor bucket? What's going on there? Well, it's because built into this wall, which is much thicker than it needs to be, now that you look at it, you're like, yeah, why would you, what's with all that extra wood? Well, it's hiding the mechanism. Inside this wall, there is a tilting piece of wood like this. And that scissoring sort of action is where the name comes from. And what happens is, I'll see if I can uh, set it up just long enough to do a, a quick throw. Um, what happens is, if I hit this flower like that, I just knocked that scissoring dampener out of the way, okay? So now, this surface acts like a drum head and it will reject this ball. I don't care how softly you throw it, it's gonna come flying out of there. It's like bouncing it off a drum, okay? So if I've set it properly, this ball will get kicked out and it won't fall through the hole, right? But now what's happened is, the other end of that scissoring mechanism is in the bottom of this basket. It it back. So now it weights it back. And now the second ball, which I dropped, I don't know where, over, here it is. The second ball will now, it will hit the dampener. The dampener moves out of the way. And that billiard effect of hitting the dampener gives up all the energy. And this ball should drop straight down into the hole, no problem. Hey, what do you know? Now, one thing, Jason, you probably didn't know about me is I can beat any Gaff carnival, carnival game. Really? Yeah, I can beat it. You know what? I think we should put a bet on this. Yeah. yeah. Let's do it. One I've got 10 bet. grand over there. Uh, okay. No, I'm just kidding. All right, so, uh, All right. so I'm, there's one other sneaky part about this that I'm going to show you, okay. uh, and that is uh, everyone suspects the baseballs. Well, there's nothing wrong with the baseballs. Yeah. You could bring your own. You know, it's still not going to work. So, um, I don't know where the damp the dampener is off right now. Okay. okay? So, so this so should, should reject. reject. This should reject. All right. So remember to hit the flower. This is the time I beat cheaters. Okay, get two in a row. That's, oh! that's one. Now, here's the thing. If I let that stay in there, yeah. you would make the second, second one, one in a row. So okay, because our dampener was obviously set. Uh, but here's the thing. So I would take this out and I'd go, great job, son. You've only got one more. Make sure you hit the flower and right into the uh, bottom it'll go. And now by tapping that flower, I knocked the dampener out of the way. So this so ball will get rejected. <laughs> I was like, what's he doing? Oh. oh, so close. One more time. Okay, so hang on a second. Let's set you to win. Okay. Okay, and the way we do that is by making sure that the dampener is set. You should be set to win now. You didn't hit the flower. Perfect, but you see what I did? You didn't let it go. I interrupted the reset mechanism. So you knocked the dampener out of, out of the way with your first winning shot. Now it'll win. And by catching it and handing it right back to you, it should kick it out, okay. and it did. So just that simple action of me going, great, you only got to get one more, it, it's now impossible. Yeah. So that's the idea. So now you should be able to win because you knocked the right. dampener away and you got one and you just do it too hard. Yeah. Now, so, I would pay good money to watch Josh lose this game all day long. He just lost. Uh, but we are running out of time. And <laughs> I know the thing you are known for is your earned collection. Yeah, so it's, it's right behind you. It is right Three behind kids. Wow. Yeah. Multiple Excuse me. So, talk us through these books. So, um, I started collecting the, the, all the variant editions of the Expert at the Card Table. By the way, we're using the word editions loosely. The author never changed his text. So, technically, these are all the same edition, but clearly they're different printings, okay? Uh, but edition is the word most people are familiar with. So, I say first edition, second edition, Drake edition, all that good stuff. Uh, so starting over there on the left, we got, I've got uh, two first editions um, in little protective cases. Um, 
And then I've got a bunch of what we refer to as Drake second editions. These are the uh, pictorial, whoops. These are the pictorial editions that are actually very pretty, um, kind of cool. And um, there's a bunch of different color variants of these, but they're all the same otherwise. So a couple of different color variants of uh, second editions, what we refer to as second editions in there. Then you get into the uh, very first paperback edition of the Expert at the Card Table, 1905 by Drake. Anytime you see that yellow cover, that's a true first paperback. And then Drake continued to print different editions throughout the uh, 1930s. Eventually, um, I guess the book got into the hands of a printing company called Frost. They produced it during the 40s, and then it kind of went out of copyright and everybody started making their own copies. So you got copy, you know, McDougall did his in 1944, uh, Card Mastery, and other people have been able to print the book. Um, I don't speak any other foreign languages, but I have all the foreign language editions that we are aware of. This is the biggest Erdnase collection in the world. Right? Uh, we think so. Yeah. So there's another guy in the Bay Area that we all know. I won't say his name in case he doesn't want me to, but uh, there's another guy that is, his collection is probably real close to mine um, in terms of size. I may have a few things that he doesn't have, uh, but he's got some absolutely beautiful pieces. Can you talk us through the connection that these seemingly unrelated paintings yeah. have? So um, if you're familiar with the expert at the card table, the only real person's name in the whole book is M.D. Smith. Marshall Dennison Smith uh, was his name. And he was a Chicago-based artist in his 20s when he did the illustrations for the expert at the card table. But he went on to become a painter of some renown. And he painted... Uh, I know of at least 30 or 40 oil paintings over the years, which probably means he painted three times that many. Uh, and I have three of them. Only two of them are in here. There's another one in my actual office where my computer and all that stuff is. Um, so these show up on eBay from time to time. In fact, uh, at the moment we're filming this, there is a Marshall D. Smith, a real M.D. Smith painting on eBay right now. It's way overpriced, but... Uh, it's been on for a month because the people that are selling it want like $10,000 for it. Um, the truth is these show up on eBay all the time for under a grand. Uh, I think I paid uh, $400 and $500 for these. Um, okay. and, uh, and the other one I have in my office was the same price. So they're, they're $500 paintings most of the time. Uh, occasionally someone puts a ridiculous price on it because it doesn't cost anything to leave it on eBay forever. You know, yeah. um, so let's let's end this because I would spend all day here if we could. But let's end by asking you if you had to pick a favorite piece to spotlight that you haven't already talked about, a, a something that doesn't have to be monetarily valuable, sure. but just really interesting to you or super rare, or you went to the ends of the earth to get it. Because I see you have a Ricky Jay collection here. You have um, history books. I mean. It's, um, so I'll tell you about a, a wonderful story um, that ends with a piece uh, in this collection. So <clears throat> I think it's three or four years ago now. Um, I'm a Di Vernon fan. I never met the guy, but um, I, uh, I'm a fan of his uh, magical output. And I've got all the books on him that I can find. And, you know, just a big Vernon fan. Um, and I have some Vernon memorabilia stuff around here. So I've got, you know, three or four Vernon uh, silhouettes that I've picked up on eBay over the years. And that's nothing. I mean, we know people that have 50 or 300 Vernon silhouettes. Um, and so about three years ago, a Vernon silhouette of a dog showed up at auction. I rescue dogs. Uh, I have four dogs myself that I'm absolutely amazed we haven't heard from uh, since you guys have been here. Uh, but I rescue golden retrievers. And this uh, Vernon silhouette of like a poodle showed up at auction. And I was bummed because I didn't have a nickel to my name. I had spent all my money on something else that week. I had no money. And I knew this thing was going to sell for three or $400. Um, and I happened to mention it to Julie Ng uh, of Magicana up in Toronto. 
And I said, I'm so bummed. And she said, why? We were at Magic Live, actually shooting the photos for the Johnny Thompson book. She said, what are you bummed about? I said, there's this Vernon dog uh, silhouette coming up for auction and I want it, but I can't afford it. I don't have four or $500 or whatever it's gonna sell for. And she went, oh, that's too bad. And three days later, in the middle of Magic Live, she walks up to me and she opens her purse and she pulls out three more original Vernon dog silhouettes and said, choose. And I felt like Daniel LaRusso in The Karate Kid where yeah, Mr. Miyagi says, choose, you know, well, for the car. She in her purse. So the one that had come up from auction came from David Ben. I didn't know that. But Julie and David, of course, have worked together for a decade. She knew that it was David's and she didn't say anything. But she called David and said, hey, before you get on the plane, Jason England would, you know, do anything for a Die Vernon dog silhouette. So David grabbed like three of them from his collection and got them to Julie and uh, she let me pick the one I want. So I chose the one, of course, that looks, looks like, like a, a golden retriever. retriever. Um, and this was my thank you for helping out with the Johnny Thompson photos, which were all shot in my house. Um, not this house, but a different house. They were either shot in my house or they were shot at uh, the Magic Live uh, or the Magic Magazine studios. So this was my gift from uh, David and Julie for helping out with the photos. Silhouetted by Vernon. And what's crazy about this is I have a golden retriever that loves to look at pictures. So he watches television. He'll look at your phone. He'll look at your iPad. Um, if you show him a picture of a dog in a magazine, he'll sit and stare at it for hours. He's kind of crazy. He will come in this room and stare at that silhouette. And it looks just like him. It's really funny. So uh, this is Cooper's favorite item in my collection because it's a little dog. It's a super nice story. I can't thank uh, David and Julie enough for, uh, for that. And it's one of my favorite pieces in here just because of how I got it, you know? Uh, and it has no value to anybody except me apart from a couple hundred dollars, but it's one of my favorite things in the whole collection because I love dogs, I love Vernon, I love how I got it, and they're just great people. So well, that's one of my favorite things. I would love to stay all day and look at this stuff, but um, this has been incredible. You have yeah, you'll have to come back and we can do the south wall one of these days. <laughs> um, so. so thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Thank no problem, much. guys.